Is DeFi dead? With dwindling trading volumes, disappearing users, and declining value deposited in DeFi apps, it's a question many are asking. By the end of today's video, you'll be better equipped than most to answer it. We've come a long way since the DeFi summer of 2020, and there's a lot to cover from the nostalgia-inducing valuations to the stomach-churning nosedives. So today, on the third anniversary of DeFi summer, we're diving deep into the sensational events, the groundbreaking innovations, and the roller coaster of DeFi to figure out if it's dead, dying, or on the mend. Ajna lets you borrow and lend with almost anything in your wallet. More on them later. Before we get stuck into the meat and potatoes of today's video, let's quickly figure out what DeFi is and isn't. DeFi, or decentralized finance, promises a world where financial systems are open, transparent, and controlled by the community. Unlike CeFi, or centralized finance, DeFi is trustless because the system relies on software, not people, to execute decisions. It's built on permissionless blockchains that are open to anyone, meaning anyone, anywhere can access them. And no single entity controls the blockchain network, so applications built on top of them can't be stopped or censored. DeFi promises even the most remote citizens of the world, or the unbanked, access to global financial systems. So with all of these in mind, DeFi offers to rid legacy financial systems of the blood-sucking intermediaries that plague it, by relying instead on peer-to-peer -peer networks of individuals pooling their capital or liquidity together. And we'll be coming right back to those vampires in just a second, but first let's figure out what on earth DeFi is actually used for. The foundational use cases for DeFi began to crystallize with these four main pillars. First, decentralized exchanges exemplified by Uniswap. Second, money markets facilitating lending, borrowing, and leveraging. Third, stablecoins like DAI, which are digital currencies pegged to the US dollar. And fourth, the introduction of leveraged and synthetic trading instruments like perpetual swaps. And again, all of these pillars are built in a permissionless way, meaning anyone, anywhere can access them, nobody can censor them, and they run with no intermediaries. Together, these primitives formed the bedrock of DeFi, attracting significant capital from traditional markets. For many, the promise of DeFi is still very much real, but we've witnessed plenty of challenges that tested DeFi's resilience too. For instance, new capital brought with it a group of speculation-hungry DeFi degens, a term used to describe the self-styled degenerate gambler traders who pushed the limits of decentralized finance by congesting networks, increasing transaction costs, and making it way too expensive to carry out the types of transactions that your average Joe might actually benefit from. Proponents of decentralization have long been opposed to this reality, as it limits DeFi's ability to deliver on its promise and become an open, transparent financial system accessible by everyone regardless of location or financial status. So the question is, were these the early signs of DeFi's impending doom or just growing pains. Well, with our newfound grasp of DeFi's history and the point of it all existing in the first place, let's look for the answer in arguably the most exciting period of time for crypto, DeFi summer. But first, a quick word from Ajna. Introducing Ajna, a new DeFi protocol that gives you the freedom to borrow and lend with almost anything in your wallet. From the oldest ERC-20s to the newest NFTs, Ajna is designed without oracles and governance, so no need to worry about oracle exploits or governance friction. Ajna massively expands what's possible in DeFi borrowing and lending. Try Ajna today on summer.fi forward slash Ajna. Now back to our story. The world of DeFi was buzzing in 2020. It was a season of innovation, wild valuations, and the birth of terms like TVL, yield farming, aping in, and DeFi blue chip that would essentially become part of our daily lexicon. But was this summer setting the stage for DeFi's grand future or sowing the seeds for its demise? We can start at the dawn of DeFi summer, which saw valuations skyrocket. TVL, total value locked, is often used to measure the health of a DeFi project and it represents the overall amount of assets locked or staked in a protocol. In 2020, DeFi TVL increased from 700 million to 15 billion, a remarkable 2,100% growth. Yield farming allowed users to earn rewards for depositing their crypto into decentralized applications or dApps, which are self-operating applications that run autonomously on a blockchain. Airdrops like the Uni token from Uniswap, the leading decentralized exchange by trading volume, epitomized the easy money to be made in the blockchain world. And with easy money came easy decisions, as DGENs aped into new projects without enough 
or even any research. But while degen culture was flourishing, so too were reputable blue chip projects, akin to the trusted household names in traditional finance. So how do we go from discussing DeFi's TVL growth, a flourishing subculture and blue chip projects to discussing its survival? To answer this, we need an overview of the 2021 to 2022 period. Starting in January 2021, we saw the rise of layer one chains adopting DeFi. These are base layer or foundational blockchains that smart contract applications can be built on. And this was important because an influx of decentralized applications being built on the Ethereum layer one blockchain saw transaction fees or gas fees rise to cost prohibitive levels. DeFi protocols on blockchains with high traffic and gas fees often provided slow and expensive services. Simple tasks were just taking too long and becoming too cost inefficient. Until ultimately, the promise of innovating to reduce transaction fees increased the inflows of users and capital into DeFi. And that's when we saw all-time TVL highs of around $250 billion by the end of the year. So you might be wondering, where did it all start going wrong? Fast forward to 2022 and the DeFi landscape had morphed. The euphoric highs of the previous year were replaced by prominent hacks, scams, exploits and rug pulls. DeFi lost around $48 billion with the spectacular collapse of centralized exchanges like FTX and the unraveling of algorithmic stablecoin Luna. So let's start by putting the year under a microscope to figure out how the crash started. Critical flaws like poor risk management, low revenues and excessive exposure to leverage were deemed to be the core reasons behind the crumbling state of DeFi. In terms of risk management, experts argued that the token economics or tokenomics of many projects were flawed as they offered unsustainably high yields just to attract new users. Secondly, failure to generate sustainable income meant that there was little value backing the tokens in the projects. And third, as users noticed their assets weren't really yielding the promised returns, they withdrew their liquidity and they sold the reward tokens. This led to a drop in token prices and a decrease in the total value locked or TVL, causing further panic and prompting more users to pull out their liquidity. And boom, you've got a vicious cycle of downwards price pressure. So then what? Prices dipped, everyone went home, end of the story? No, of course not. We haven't even got into leverage yet. Oh, leverage, you wild thing. What's this? Leverage. Without leverage, my $20 position is worth $20. But with leverage, I can amplify the size of my position and aim for much, much higher profits. Now, of course, my exposure to risk and losses is also amplified. Okay, now back to the collapsing DeFi realm, where it wasn't only regular users being degens, as it turns out, it was also the institutions. The core values of transparency and trustlessness went out the window for centralized institutions and lending firms like Celsius, which used DeFi in their backend to generate higher yield. They misled users and lied about leverage, APYs, and the amount of money their clients could make. They exposed themselves and their clients to undue risk, and they accelerated the DeFi downturn of 2022 as trust in crypto in general eroded. And what about FTX? Sam Bankman Fried's centralized exchange that collapsed, later revealing they had illegally used customer funds. Or Terra Luna, the algorithmic stablecoin that crashed, leaving an estimated $60 billion hole behind. And we certainly can't forget Three Arrows Capital, the crypto hedge fund that went belly up causing a market meltdown. Surely these were all signs of the beginning of the end for DeFi and surely DeFi would not survive. Well, according to Andre Kronje and many more in the space, DeFi is far from dead. He argues that yields in DeFi, particularly from ETH and DAI, behave differently in bull and bear markets. And he also asserts that DeFi has grown significantly and that it will persist, though its potential is currently constrained by some of the technological and regulatory challenges which we still need to address. Others like financial planner Adam Bloomberg argue that DeFi is neither dead nor shrinking, because despite the commentary that DeFi is dead inside or the sector is in shrinking or stalling mode, he says we're still experimenting with this new technology and mistakes will naturally be made. It's also important to note that the failures of FDX, Celsius and Three Arrows Capital are all from centralized and opaque entities. And this shows exactly why we need a more transparent financial system where the user knows the risks they're taking, exactly how their money is being used and where they have full control of their cash. 
meaning when things do go wrong, they can withdraw at any time. Major institutions like Mastercard, Visa, Coca-Cola, Nike, Starbucks, BlackRock and Fidelity continue to pour money and effort into applying and finding new use cases of DeFi technology. TradFi giants like JP Morgan and BlackRock believe that the tokenization of real-world assets is here to stay. In preparation for the next billion users, an ecosystem of layer 1 and 2 solutions are working in unison to help scale Ethereum. L2s like Arbitrum and Optimism, along with newer entrants like Linnea and Base, are some examples of the scaling Ethereum roadmap being in full swing. And what about derivatives? Well, DeFi derivatives currently stand at $180 billion, which is definitely a big leap from the $25 billion they were at in 2020. Wrapped derivatives such as WBTC and WETH have seen a staggering 2,000% growth in search interest over just five years. So the fact that we're now in a less profitable period than the DeFi summer of 2020 perhaps isn't sufficient to argue that the end of DeFi is nigh. Although from a security perspective, two conclusions emerge about trust. The high profile rugs, hacks and exploits clearly pose a threat and limit trust in the system. Second, the impact of con artists and scammers which emerged in the absence of heavy regulation shouldn't be taken lightly. So no, DeFi is not dead, but it is going through a necessary evolution where risks become clearer for the users. DApps are able to create sustainable value, which means they are delivering actual value, not just giving away tokens. And DeFi infrastructure or the layer one and layer two base layers are becoming more scalable. So we've gone through the roller coaster journey of DeFi's development since 2019 till today. We've learned about the underlying principles and the promise of DeFi and the innovations that really drive the space. We've seen the ups, the downs, the criticisms and the growing interest from larger institutions. Knowing what you now do, let us know in the comments below, do you think DeFi is dead, dying or on the mend? Thank you for tuning in and stay defiant.